Okay, it's Jimmy Brenner with uh, COPCAST from CTOA, uh, Canadian Tactical Officers Association. And today I have a, a guest, Eric Elper. Uh, Eric, tell us a bit about yourself. You, I know you're like a musicologist and uh, you're a writer about music. You, sometimes you're a radio host. Yeah, sometimes I'm all of those things at once. Um, yeah, uh, uh, primarily I'm a music publicist. That's what I do during the day, afternoon, evening, and in the middle of the night is I work a lot with uh, with independent artists and artists that have sold millions of albums around the world. Um, and then uh, in the morning before my day starts, uh, I guess I, I post a lot or at least set up uh, a lot of the posts on social media to run for the rest of the day. And I also have a radio show on Sirius XM called At That Eric Alper, which is um, coincidentally the name of my handle on social media. And uh, I've been doing this uh, since uh, 1995. So uh, I was told that there would be no math. So somebody else can try to figure <laughs> that out. Yeah, well, you're somewhat uh, younger than I am. Um, well, we're both 29, so yes, you know, maybe yes. maybe a, a couple of months here and there. Yeah, uh, but what I'm fascinated is that in your being somewhat younger, uh, 29 than I am, uh, that you know so much about music history, and uh, like some of your posts, you post, you know, classic record albums that immediately bring me back to that time. And, and it, I just think it's fantastic because I start to remember all the good times and music yeah. brings you back to special times in your life. And so how did you, obviously you had to uh, look up what I grew up with, but you have so much knowledge about it. Yeah, well, I I, I follow you secretly um, in real life and then I figure out what you uh, listen to and then I'm just going, oh, okay, well, I should just, I should just post this for Jim. Um, you know, when, when I, I, I've always loved music. Um, when I was eight years old, I saw the movie American Hot Wax in the theaters, right. which told the story of the uh, the Cleveland DJ Alan Freed, and it was a it was a docudrama. It was, it wasn't a documentary at all. Um, uh, and for the first time, I saw the real life characters playing themselves of Chuck Berry and Jerry Lee Lewis on the screen, um, and it blew me away. It was like somebody else's version of Star Wars or science fiction or Dungeons and Dragons, where it was like, that's what I love. That's what I want to do. I have no idea about any of these people. Uh, and I'm going to try to figure it out. Um, and, you know, my sister had a really great record collection of a lot of pop hits of the day. She had Donny Osmond, who I just oh. saw over the weekend. Um, wow. And he was awesome. Um, but, you know, like, well, I read like 16 magazine and teen beat and read all about these Hollywood celebrities and, and pop stars and rock stars and stuff. And, and it was just a whole other world that was just fantasy to me. It was like this world just doesn't exist in mind, you know. Um, but my grandfather had a bar in Toronto that's still standing. It's called Grossman's Tavern. Oh, um, you're kidding me. Yeah. So his name was Al Grossman, and so yes. my it was my mother's fa uh, father. And the more I was a kid, um, we used to hang out there. And I have one or two really clear memories of dancing on the dance floor while this jazz or Dixieland jazz band or blues band is playing. Um, but I learned more and more about the history when I was a kid. Um, that because the, the 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 bar was in Kensington Market in Toronto, which you know for people who may not know, it was essentially where all the hippies were. Um, it, it was you know one of the great melting pot areas of Toronto, where not only did you have the hippies, but you had a lot of immigrants that were coming to Toronto, living down there, you know, with their entire families down there. Um, so I found out that, you know, later on in my life, I found out that my grandfather used to house all the draft dodgers that used to yes, come to, um, to to Canada, to Toronto, upstairs in the rooms. And my, my family lived there and stuff, or at least my mom when she was a kid and everything. And my cousins worked there at one time or another. But when I was 13, um, for my birthday, I, I asked for a subscription to Billboard magazine. Um, and I devoured it. It was not only memorizing the charts um, as a geek, but also reading about the stories of the music industry, what a record label does, what a manager does, what a booking agent does. Who are these people that keep getting 
in the magazine week after week after week. And that's where I kind of found out more about the industry. And that's really where where my fascination with not only music present, but music history kind of comes in because, um, you know, nothing comes from nothing and, and everything has to start somewhere. So in order for me to kind of appreciate and look at even K-pop artists today, like BTS or somebody like Lady Gaga or somebody like Taylor Swift breaking records. It didn't happen in a vacuum. It has to come from somewhere else. So I was always interested in the sociology of music and not just music of what it does with the brain. Cause I, 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 I know that stuff, but it's also, um, you know, psychologically and, and what happens, you know, in the economy, what happened during, you know, racial times, what happened um, during all of it to actually create something like Bob Dylan going electric in 1965 at the Newport yes. Folk Festival. Like they we're happy with that. That at all. And so it, it's a matter of why that was such a big deal, what happened afterwards, what changed. And that just leads you down rabbit holes that I still love. I still read books and autobiographies and uh, critical theory books all the time because I love it. I love finding out not only about music because what I, what, I, what I love about it is that it's not just about the song. It's nice to know that like this song hit number 14 on 1968. Like, I, I, you know, that stuff is, is neat. But um, I, I'm more, the more that I know about music, the more that I feel like I know about people. And it's my... It's kind of my gateway to finding out more about this world that we all live in and share. But you're exactly right. You said at the top, you know, the ability for music to to put you right back into those moments. I mean, music has always made people forget and it's always made people remember. And uh, I kind of just latched on to this idea when I got on social media that I was always going to use it for good. I was never going to criticize. I was never going to slam anybody. Um, and as a publicist, you never know who you're going to be working with down the road. So there's people I don't really like or appreciate, but I would never say that publicly because a, I never know if the manager of that band or that label has somebody else that they want me to work. So, you know, job wise, it doesn't make sense for me to go there, but I'm just not that kind of person where I would wade into any controversy because nobody cares about my opinion on that stuff. But there's, there's better people who do this for a living that look for the hits, that need the views, that need all the publicity and and the clickbait to survive. I don't. I do I do fine doing publicity and I'm happy to do it that way. So my whole social media is is I try to just make things that are full of positivity and good vibes and that's all I really wanted to do. Well I well I spent many a you know enjoyable night at Grossman's and oh, yeah. was, in, at, across the street at the Alma Combo, and yeah, uh, back in the day, Toronto between Wednesday and, and Sunday, you, you, there's so many places you could go to see live music. Oh yeah, the Silver Dollar, and and, yeah, it, Silver Dollar, and uh, Silver, yeah, Silver Dollar, Dollar yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, Portion, yeah I uh, mean, there there were times when I first when I when when I started hitting a little bit of a stride for the first time doing publicity because it was a struggle. It was like, you know, I didn't know that many people. I mean. You know, I had that that Grossman's connection, yeah. but it, it wasn't like, you know, suddenly I was doing all the PR for all those bands on there. I, I still don't, you know, so um, but there was a time when I was doing PR for artists that were playing at the Elma Combo and the Silver Dollar and the Free Times Cafe and Lee's Palace and Horseshoe. And on Friday night, I would go visit like, you know, five or six bars and venues that I would be doing the PR for for artists there and a lot of them in the beginning of my career I, I just I got paid in food yes, like, yes, and, yes. and it wasn't like I was broke it was like I was so desperate and psychologically hungry to work that some of the bars and restaurants I was working with they, they I said to them like you don't have to pay me just whenever I come in be great to just you know have a coke on the house you know and that was it so whenever I took you know, bands to have meetings with. I would always go down to one of the places I was working. And so, you know, but that was, uh, that was a lot of fun, you know, because I, I, I stunk. Yeah, because I stunk. 
I yeah, sucked at well, it. But it was a special time in Toronto, though. Yeah. I, I, I don't think a lot of the people realize the, the music history that, that Toronto has. I mean, so many great musicians came out of Toronto. Uh, you know, in oh, Hamilton yeah. as well. Uh, Lighthouse. Oh, yeah, you know, with Lighthouse. Uh, yeah. Oh, in the 80s when much music was, was first starting out, it would really put the spotlight on not only the entire Canadian scene, um, but artists like Molly Johnson and Big oh, Sugar yeah. and Blue Rodeo and The Pursuit of Happiness and The Spoons and Platinum Blonde and, and all those artists in the 80s where I grew up with uh, all lived in my city, which completely blew me away because, you know, I've, I've talked to a lot of artists about that era and it was like the day before they got their video played on Much Music, they were playing to six people and the bartender at the Cameron House and after they was started Cameron having House, their, that's Blue yeah, Rodeo's uh, home base, right. yeah. Yeah, and afterward they, you know, they were selling out five, six hundred, you know, seat, you know, small clubs and so that was just the power of television back then. Yeah, very Dylan-esque uh, Blue Rodeo. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so good, so good. Guys are so great too. So, for me, it's like between '67 and '74 was like the, you know, the the powerhouse of, yeah. of, of uh, growth in music. Uh, you know, we had the change from the Mop Cop Beatles to the Hippie Beatles. Yeah, uh, Magical Mystery Tour and Sgt. Pepper's, and uh, you know, then the Stones really came alive in '72. Right. Uh, had the yeah, '60s the come back. So yeah. much happened in that time, and and where it all went, I, I I feel actually kind of sorry for young people today because they just don't get that that spectrum of music that you know, and it's not really connect. You can't really connect the dots yeah. back to the blues and where it came from. Yeah, it's it's just different, you know. I, I mean, that era that you were talking about, rock and roll, was only like maybe fifteen years old. It it, it would be like. You know, with rap music in 1979, having a breath, and it was just a breath of, of music and songs and fashion and culture and politics all, all you know, by, by 1991. And so, you know, it, it, especially in Toronto, where the Yorkville scene is still, I think, really underappreciated, where you had David Clayton Thomas of Blood, yes. Sweat, and Tears, and Neil yeah. Young hanging out there, and Joni Mitchell, and Bob Dylan, and Gordon Lightfoot, and Rick James playing with Neil Young in the Minor Birds, and Murray McLaughlin, right. and Bruce Coburn, yeah. and uh, Leona Boyd, and all, Leona of these Boyd. Artists, where all of these artists were playing, you know, at these places that were literally within three blocks of one another in Yorkville. Well, they'd um, actually they'd actually play on the street. You, yeah, you, you would right. walk down Yorkville, and and again, it it doesn't look anything like it looked back then. No, but but you'd see these artists on the street, and then you'd also see aspiring artists on the street that were fantastic, and they would pay for like to pass the hat around that they play for for that. It, it was great. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And today it's just different. You know, like, you know, when you heard a song on the radio, you had to hope and pray that you had enough money to take a bus and go down to the record store and Sound hope the that they man. have it. Yeah. Go down to the record man. Hope that you have that they have one of four copies that they might still have on the shelf. Open it up, play it. And that was the only thing that you played until you can afford to go get another one. And now... You know, if you're growing up, it, it the ability to have every, a seemingly every single song ever recorded in history available at your fingertips and watch them play on YouTube is astonishing to me. It still is. I, you know, the overwhelming factor of opening up something like Spotify or YouTube for a couple of seconds is still like, I don't know what I want to listen to. I know I have everything available, but sometimes there's that lack of, I, and I'm going to paint everybody in the same generation Z or Y or X with the same brush, you know, it, it, the ability to, to not spend the time and effort and energy to listen to something because you know that you can either delete it from your playlist or just skip to the next song. I, 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 and, you know, this is such a cliche of like, well, back in my day, like back in my day, um, 
you watched what somebody made a decision to show you. You know, um, much music was designed and programmed by a handful of people. So Agreed. they did what was there. Um, the radio stations always had a music director and a program director mm -hmm. deciding what was what we were all going to hear. Um, and that was it. And then you bought something and, you know, a lot of the best albums probably grew on you that maybe just didn't hit you for the first time. And that's where I think a lot of the music is just really disposable now because it's, it's, it's way too much music. There's now 140,000 songs being uploaded onto Spotify each and every day and 160,000 for New Music Friday. Um, there, there might have been maybe 7,000 albums being released a year throughout the 1970s that's and and maybe a handful of those are still heard more than a hundred times today so it's it's just different and i i wonder what is actually going to stick for the next 20 or 30 years or are we still going to be listening to fleetwood mac and the who and janice joplin and the stones and the beatles and bruce springsteen and everything else you hit the nail on the head where a lot of music today is disposable but to me you know, the Beatles and Dylan are, are, are more like, uh, you know, Beethoven. It's it's yeah. it's timeless. It will be there forever because, like, right. you know, I mean, look at Dylan. He was a poet more than he was really a musician. And, and a lot of, you know, people don't realize how many, like Hendrix, how many rock stars recorded Dylan songs, yeah. you know. It's, but so I think some people were timeless where today, as you said, there's so much to choose from. And it doesn't really seem to have a like a soul to it. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's always been that argument that the more computers and the more AI gets involved with music, the, the, the less human it is. Um, uh, but it's also something else, too. You know, you might have heard in the last couple of years, um, Bruce Springsteen selling his catalog. Yeah. Uh, the his rights uh, to a third party for five hundred million dollars or Bob Dylan selling his for three hundred fifty million, or Neil Young selling the rights to exploit his catalog and and the master recordings for you know a hundred, a hundred and fifty million dollars, and countless and dozens and dozens and dozens of artists are doing the same thing for a couple of reasons. One is that you get a big check right now, and it's easy, it's a lot easier to kind of deal with your estate when you're older to figure out where the money is going to go rather than having people argue over over tens of millions of dollars. The other big reason is that a lot of these artists just want to live forever in their music. And yep. these companies that are buying Bruce Springsteen for a half a billion dollars, it's not a birthday present to them. They're going to work and try to get that money back. And they're going to get it back by putting those songs in television and movies and commercials and greatest hits albums and the metaverse and all of these things. So I, I think you're, I think you're exactly right that, you know, we are going to be listening to all of those artists from the fifties and sixties and seventies forever. And there's no reason to think that artists like a Tony Bennett or a Frank Sinatra right. or the doors or Pink Floyd or Led Zeppelin are going to be the next 200 years version of what we consider classical music. Yeah, it's like I said, they're, they're incredible times, you know, and then you can see the connection from Chuck Berry to to Keith Richards. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's so many connections that, uh, you know, that bring us to where we are now uh, that, again, with new, like the last album I bought was Stevie Ray Vaughan, Double Trouble. Like, that's the last, you know, and then we went to CDs and then it got, a, you know, and then I, I kind of stopped. So how do you listen point. to music now? Uh, now I do a lot on YouTube, you know. Yeah. Uh, typically I have, you know, a thousand albums in my house and I still have a turntable and that type of thing. But it's just so easy to go onto YouTube, plus yeah. I get the video uh, from it. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's just more convenient uh, to, for me to do it that way. But I, but I continue to go back, uh, you know, to what I know or what I prefer. That said, as I get older, I do... Uh, appreciate Sinatra and Tony Bennett much more than I right. did when I was younger. Right. Because again, because there's a connection. You, you get it. Yeah. And you get it. You understand the wee hours of the night, you know, you yeah. understand because even Tony Bennett's like, I left my heart in San Francisco or fly me to the moon. It's not his, about, his, his phrasing. You yeah. know, amazing. But it's not about San Francisco. It's really not about the moon. 
it's right. it's about leaving something or somewhere behind or the hopes and dreams of getting to the moon that maybe you have to temper your expectations and and but it's okay to still have dreams and hopes and and leave places and get so you you know when you're 15 you have no concept of that you know um but as you get older and you realize yeah. that your friends are dying and people are getting divorced and people are forced to leave and people are forced to retire and they're forced to give up on their hopes. Um, you really, that music just... It sounds like you're talking about country music now. Yeah, you're, it hits that much <laughs> harder when you're older than when you are when you're 15 years old. You know, Even yeah. though at the time, Frank Sinatra and and uh, and Tony Bennett, I mean, man, did they have their... Well, their Frank Sinatra was the, was the David Bowie of his time. Yeah. Like he was, he, he was out there. Like, oh you know, yeah, he had, uh, yeah. He, he had his know. screaming girls exactly. throwing their the underwear. Boxers, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is kind of scary to know that your grandmother and grandfathers were throwing their their article of the clothing away. But you know, that's yeah. a really cre creepy thought. But yes, it's it all happens all the time. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna. Uh, I saw your post today about Taylor Swift, and she's got what the top four. Yeah, she's got four albums in the Billboard top 10 in the billboard 200 album charts it's so the second speaking, week in a row and the first living artist to do it since 1966 yeah. so i was just speaking to grant my producer here what if the beatles had social media could they have been bigger oh no they would have gotten canceled in 1966 when john <laughs> lennon said that they were bigger than jesus um the 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 great thing about those artists that we're talking about from the 50s and 60s the the amazing thing about them is that social media wasn't around and it allowed us to to not even have a concept of what their life was like until somebody told us what their life was like um i didn't you know growing up in the 80s i had no idea what Duran Duran's hairstyle was that week until four months later. And it came out with the color photo in a magazine that right. I had to wait to buy it, You had no idea about news in music until Rolling Stone wrote about it. Mm -hmm. When Jim Morrison died in Paris, it took almost three weeks for the news to get to North America, to the general public, because you, there wasn't anybody there. He died. He got buried. If nobody talks about it, nobody knows about it. And now we know every, I know more about an artist that I'm not really a fan of than my next door neighbor. And that's my fault. That's on me. Right. Um, but you know, we, Janis Joplin would have never survived longer than six months because at the first instance of drug and alcohol abuse, uh, people would have put her into rehab and started scolding her to her face. Well, well, on on, what, about, what about Amy Winehouse? Yeah. Similar, similar type of problem. Yeah. Issue. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, that Amy's situation was more of the British tabloids hounding her right. every day for photos, which put immense pressure on her, which essentially just made her hate her life in some right. aspects of it. Um, but now, I mean, I, I could never, I, I, I have a lot of pity and sympathy for a 17, 18, 19 year old artist coming up now, because not only do they have to write the best song in the world, but they also have to make sure that they don't do anything dumb or stupid on social media. And at that age, you're bound to be dumb and stupid and make mistakes every single day. Like you and I did. We just didn't have to well, do it in front of the world. Yeah. I often say good advice is based in bad experience. So. <laughs> that, that's great. That's a great line. That's a great tweet right there. You should post that on, on LinkedIn and, yeah. and Twitter. Yeah. Yeah, it's absolutely true. And sometimes you don't get that second chance. Okay, so last thing I'm going to ask you is uh, Desert Island, top three albums. Oh, wow. It's um, hard, isn't it? Yeah. I can't do uh, this. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really tell my, my age right now, but um, probably my most listened to album that I still listen to almost once a week is Tears for Fears, Songs from the Big Chair. Yeah. That album is, um, which is, which is right there, actually, which is okay, right there. See, um, yeah. the, uh, the reason why I love being in music and not being able to play a note of anything 
still to this day. I can't play harmonica. I can't play guitar. I can't play drums. I suck in the studio. You put me in there, I will probably accidentally erase everything. But the reason why I love music is because to me it's magic. You playing guitar today is you making a sound out of an inanimate object that is so foreign to me, but I love it. So when I think of songs from the big chair, I think of those two guys starting in the studio with a complete blank tape and creating one of my favorite albums of all time. Um, I love, I love Genesis Abacab. Okay. Um, I adore the band. Uh, I love the Phil Collins era. Uh, I still listen to that album a lot, and it's something that uh, that I I know every note of. Um, and I'm probably I think uh, Talk Talk Spirit uh, the uh, the Color of String uh, Spring album from from 1985. Um, I I love that album. Life's What You Make It is going to be my song that I told my wife I want to be played at my funeral. So realistically, those three albums, because they're a little bit different from one another, um, but they're the albums that I played over and over and over again, and not because something was going on in my life that was like, oh, I'm connected to that album. I just, I just can't believe that human beings created that record. So there's my three. Yeah, that's not bad. Like I said, I have real trouble. Uh, yeah. yeah, what's yours? If I had to go right now, I'd say Deep Purple Machine Head. Yeah, nice. The White Album, and then probably Elvis, uh, like, uh, you know, Honolulu, the Hawaii. Uh, tour. Right. Because um, it, it kind of covers a broad spectrum. My grandfather once told me that if I'm dating a girl and her favorite album is the Beatles' White Album, run away. <laughs> Um, and it took me some time to figure that out. Um, I, and I don't know if it was accurate, but it's it's kind of hold true for some of the for some of the people I dated. Um, it's a real it's a real quagmire album that it is just all over the place and thrilling and exciting and bizarre and scary and beautiful at the same time. So I, I kind of dig that album. Yeah, good choices. Yeah. Well, like I say, but in the next five minutes, I'll have three other choices. So <laughs> right. it's it's really difficult. Well, come for me back. I got nothing else going on. No, well, actually, I, I really enjoyed this, and I, I'd love to have you back. Maybe have you in the studio. Oh, I got any uh, time. Because I can, for, again, for I can go on about time. this for hours, and I think if we sat yeah. down together, yeah, we'd have a wonderful discussion about yeah. music history. And uh, Happy to do it. Let's, let's yeah. go through some of those goofy questions I ask, and I'll get to ask you about the first album you ever bought or – what album do you listen to from start to finish? And, and yeah, I'm happy to do that. That'd be love, great. Love That's what fantastic. you're doing. And congratulations on the podcast and, 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 thank and you the organization so as well. Okay. Thank you, sir. Have a great day. You Bye -bye. too. Bye-bye.